to tell you, I've been a reader ever since I was four years of age. And I've got, well, let's see, I've interviewed over 3,000 authors in the 13 years I've had my own talk show. And most of them have been nonfiction. Now, occasionally I will have an author that does fiction, but they've got to have a good story. Because if they don't have a good story, if they don't captivate me, I'm not interested. And I get a lot of submissions. If you were to come into my house, my living room has books, my dining room has books, my kitchen has books, my bedroom has books. Both bedrooms have books. Some of them are stored somewhere. They're all through the house. My husband said if I had kept every book that I'd done an interview on, we'd have to have a library. You know, just as have something back there. But I have a passion for books. I have a passion for writing. And the reason I do, contrary to a lot of popular opinions today, the books are going to become obsolete. They're not. Books never grow old. Good stories never die. And there is something magic about the written word. And if nothing else, you need to know that if you're going to write, you need to write not just with up here, but from here. You need to be able to put part of yourself into what you do. That is so very important. So many times, and I know, I can remember when I, I did a written something or other for a class, and when I was writing, I thought I was supposed to say things a certain way. I was supposed to copy other people. That's normal. That's what you do. We're all copycats. We're all going to copy somebody that we admire. If you're wise when you're reading and you find those authors that you really resonate with, when they grip you and you're sitting there and you're reading it, and that is a becoming a part of you, you've got this book in front of you, and someone says, it's time for lunch. You said, thank you. Okay, take a hot dog. Get it for me, and I'm busy. You will not drop the book. You won't let it go. Why? Because there's emotion in it, there might be passion, there might be pain, there might be horrific stories that in your wildest dreams you will never experience that. But somehow, that author has put it together. Now, I brought a couple of books with me. One is Requiem of a Spy. This is written by a retired Major General. He was in charge of SAC. Now, I love anything about Russia, typically fascinates me. Politics, so many different things. But when I started reading this book, I knew as soon as I picked it up, and as soon as I started reading it, this was a story about his life. What's the author's name? Chris Adams. And he is now, I think, in his 70s. And he's a phenomenal writer. But from the moment I picked up the book, there was a relationship that developed with the written word. Why? Because as human beings, we want to relate to what we read. How many times have you read a book, you've gone through it? I have. I've reviewed thousands of people's material. And you look at it and say, well, that's nice. No, I don't think I'm going to take that one. What is it? It is that personal something that resonates with you. You feel it. The author has captured an emotion. Maybe you're searching for something. Maybe deep inside of you, you have questions in your own life. You're scared. You're frightened. You don't know that you are entering maybe into a new phase of your life. I don't care what age you are. You take a 10-year-old, and you have a good story. And you sit that 10-year-old down, and you start telling that 10-year-old a story about a valley where children and animals can talk to each other. They can actually understand what they're saying. And they're there for a very, very special experience. That's my story, God's Kiss. Now, I wrote this for three to ten-year-olds. And I've done readings with them. This is an illustrated book. This is a, pa a factor of fiction. So when you're thinking of fiction, and if you're wanting to be a writer, You've got so many modalities that you can go into. You don't have to be someone that is pseudo-intellectual, the psychiatrist of psychiatrists. You don't have to do that. Yet you need to be able to explore your own mind. 
you need to allow a muse, a muse. Every author I've ever interviewed that has written fiction will often say when they're writing their stories, there is something that happens. Their characters come alive and their characters start telling them what to say. I know, that's what happens. That's what happens. And there is something so magical. And when you have that happen to you, you need to write it down. You don't worry about it being a capital A at the right place. You don't worry about the commas. You don't worry about the exclamation points. You write. You let the muse speak to you. You don't worry about the actual historical fact or anything else. Your characters are going to come to life. And what's fascinating is that as your characters come to life, you're going to find there's additions that you've never expected. Another character will come in and visit you. And you'll say, oh, I've got a talking giraffe. Or, oh my goodness, there is this insanely mad redhead professor that wears stiletto heels. See, you've got to have something here that grabs your attention. Now, Scott, when he was talking to you earlier, was making a comment that I thought was very important, and that is observation. Have you ever sat in a place like McDonald's and just had a journal in front of you? You have absolutely nothing on your mind whatsoever, and you eavesdrop on everybody that's going around you. The old guy that can barely walk, that comes in and has a double order of chocolate, has 14 cookies, and you say, oh my goodness, that guy's nuts. But what are you observing? What do you notice about him? Does he have a limp? What is it that's going on with him? Are you interested in enough to even talk to the man? Ask him what he does. How many of you, if you're sitting in a Starbucks or someplace else, will talk to the person that's sitting next to you? You will. Good for you. What kind of questions do you ask them? What are they working on? Why are they there? Wonderful. You need to make notes <laughs> because you're going to meet some of the wackiest characters in your life. You're going to, it's just, there is something about the telling of a story. And when it comes to fiction, there really are no rules. You've got to get down the guts of whatever it is that you have there. Now, you can always polish it later. But I had a woman that submitted a book to me. And the topics, there's no sacred topic here. There's no anything. It's your guts and your courage to address something that may be totally alien to most of the people you meet. Now, I brought this book. It's called An Evolving Society. The author's name is Fadi Hattendorf. Now, this to me, the, the cover stinks as far as I'm concerned. The title doesn't say anything to me. This is a terrific story. What is she talking about? She's addressing something that happened in her own life. And I knew it as soon as I started reading it. And it grabbed my attention because she's talking about babies that are born to surrogate mothers and adopted by other people. Men going into sperm, sperm banks when they're in college to make some extra money. And they can be the father of 300 children and not know anything about it. A genetic factor that comes in here, that weaves throughout the story, it is gripping. She's approaching something that is entirely, I can guarantee you, in most conversations, is not even considered. The reason she wanted to tell this story, and she did it in a fictitious format, because fiction is safe. How many times have you read a fictitious story, and you have found that the author has put so much truth in it? It could be a political discourse. It could be a talk about a society. It could be about anything. It could be about health conditions. Why do you think it's so gripping? Because the truth is there. And it's safe. They can't get sued when they put it in fiction. 
Chris Adams, which I was just mentioning to you, he is such a phenomenal writer. He has also put out a nonfiction book that another general challenged him to do, and it's called The Ideologies of the Cold War. Now, I'm telling you, it's gripping. It's all fact, and it's about the United States and Russia. The only reason he put that book together, and it took him years to get it done, because it was incredible research. Now, that is nonfiction. But after he had written his first novel, this is not his first novel. This is the last one he did. After he'd written his first novel, one of the generals that he had known said, I want you to meet somebody. And he said, um, we're in Washington, D.C., let's go to lunch. So Chris said, sure. He had no idea the person he was going to meet was Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy died just a short time ago. Now, Tom Clancy had a way of expressing stories where you would shift from one modality of time into another, from, and things were going on simultaneously, and had a way of gripping you with the power of his story. And that is why he became so renowned as an author. He was using fact. They were even considering arresting him at one time, because he had so much truth in his novel. Well, this man, Tom Clancy, he's meeting right there at lunch with these two generals, one of them Chris, and he listened to Chris's experiences. He said, you have all of this knowledge, all of this inside information. Don't write faction. What you do is write fiction. You put it in a cloak, and you'll be able to get your information out to the people that read the book, and they'll see the truth, they'll know it's the truth, and they will recognize the truth. It's a phenomenon, and he has a story. The Sasha, the character that's in this book, is a real person. But because he wrote it in fiction, and I know the truth is in there because I was in Russia in 1992. I was on a business trip there, and I know so much of what he was talking about. I know the inside line on that. This is fascinating reading. But again, he incorporated his personal experience. Now, you know that Scott has been a guest on my show a couple of times. When I picked up Scott's book, Better You Go Home, I thought, what does that title say? That doesn't say anything. But I learned a long time ago, you don't judge a book by its cover. It's a very important aspect when you're selling a book, by the way. But when I started reading the story, and I knew immediately that there had been a very personal space, because when I read, it's just part of me. It's just something that when I go through it, I've got to have a story that has guts to it. I'm not interested in a shoot 'em up, gee whiz, sex crazed maniac that's gone out and slaughtered 45 women, and this is what's going to be happening, and there's this side, the seedy side of life. I have a novel at, at my office that someone sent me. The writing is good, but the subject matter, I went ho-hum. Now somebody else might pick it up and go, oh, gee, this is great. But it had no meat in it. It didn't have any substance. Scott's book has a lot of information. It goes into the black market. He suddenly brings forth so many informations about a culture, the nuances. And he can tell you, when I interviewed him, I brought up another number of questions about this. And you can listen to the interview if you want to. Go to PWR Talk. P like Paul, W like Walter, R like Robert, talk.com, go into the Donna Sebo show, and you can go in and listen to any of the interviews. And Scott was with me, and he answered my questions, which drew out more of a personal. When I do interviews with people, I want to represent the authors in the best way I can. So if your material has substance, like Fadi's, which related, and she came out on air and told me, that she had adopted a child that had been birthed by a surrogate mother. Right there, you've got a connection. Right there, you have something here. You see, part of this has to come from you. That's why I said it's got to be the heart as well as the head. And fiction is wonderful. It's absolutely marvelous. There was a woman who is an exquisite artist. She's up at a Camino Island, and her name is Verdale. And she had sent me a draft of the novel she was writing. And it was about a homeless person. She had done a wonderful job with it. It was good. But her characters lacked substance. And so I made the suggestion to her. I said, why don't you go and volunteer at a homeless shelter? 
She said, I will never do that as long as I live. I said, why not? She said, oh, my goodness, the characters that are down. Oh, it's, so, it's just not safe. I wouldn't be there. And I said, now, wait a minute. You're writing about a very real happening with someone. Her character was a young woman who had entered into cycles of experience that anyone can go into. I mean, life is not fair. You can get kicked in the teeth at the weirdest times. It's not fair. So sometimes you have to have experiences to find out who you are. And that's part and parcel of what the story was. But when you go into a homeless shelter, what is the first thing you know? Have you ever been in a homeless shelter? OK. What is the first thing? that you noticed when you went into that homeless shelter? What's the very first thing that hit you? It smells. I agree. The first thing is the smell. You have the sweat. You have the smell of urine. You have the smell of filth. And if you've never been in it, you never forget it as long as you live. How many of you have ever been in a mental institution? What's the first thing you noticed when you went into that environment? It's actually quiet. OK. What else did you notice after the quiet? Um, a lot of locked doors and security. All right, so now you were in that environment. Do you see the picture that you're painting right there? You're walking in to an environment, into a mental hospital. Now, you're not hearing screaming patients, as depicted in so many Hollywood renditions of saying, this isn't over the cuckoo's nest. What you're seeing is the quiet, locked doors, people hidden away. There are secrets behind every door. Have you ever wondered what might be behind one of those doors? Do you see my point? You see, I'm speaking at this time. But one of the things you need to remember when you're writing, whatever your style is, you need to be able to convey that in the written form. One of the best things you can do when you've done some writing is read it out loud. Read your writing out loud. Because when you're reading it, you'll know whether you're feeling it, whether you're, you're with those characters. It's very important. It makes a difference. Now, Scott said he wanted me to give you six points. I've already given you a couple. Healing, uh, not healing, feeling. Feeling. And also, then when you get your basic stuff together, then you may want to do your research. What's your setting going to be? Where are you going to, are you going to be out on the streets of Seattle? If so, get on your walking shoes and put on nondescript clothes and go out and walk. If you're going to be riding around a vineyard, go and walk in a vineyard. It's very important that you do your research, but you try to do your research in a way that allows you to sort of immerse yourself in that environment that you're trying to convey. And above all, don't limit your imagination. I love animation movies. I just think they're the greatest thing. They are absolutely fabulous. I'll watch them sometimes over and over again because I see so many characters in there. And I think, how did that come about? How did they manage to put six toes on the left ear of the pink elephant? I mean, I really don't get it, but I love it. Don't be afraid to explore different things. And movies, if you watch movies, if you find out what it is that you like in a movie, maybe you like the movies that are on Hallmark that always have these stories that have a little bit of of, of the heart and the love stories and just, just feel-good, warm stories. Is that something you want to write? Or do you want something god-awful like Stephen King where after you finish reading it, you feel like you've got to keep your eyes open for the next 500 years of your life because you don't want whatever he comes up with to come around the corner. You just know there's something in your basement. I mean, this is, this is what you need to remember. What do you relate to? What is it that brings you joy when you see it? What's the mystery? Is there a mystery? Or is there something so out there that nobody sees it? Fascinating stuff. History. Scott in his book goes into history. Chris in his book goes into history. If you find yourself in environments 
that you really resonate with and you want to make that a part of what you're writing, go visit the places. If you can't afford it, go to your library. Take everything out of the library you possibly can that's going to relate to your environment. If you're wanting to write, for example, about Russia, find some Russians. Talk to them. Get books on the art. Get in to the guts of something. Don't be afraid to deal with what you've never seen before. If you're going to write about surgery, see if you can check out a surgeon that will let you watch. If you can stay awake and, you know, stay attentive but not pass out from all the blood, that's a good thing. But you need to be around the environments. You need to smell them. You need to hear them. You need to feel them. And more than anything else, you need to talk to people. You know, in our society, we're so, we're so alienated so many times. We're, we're afraid to talk to somebody, to find out who they are, what they've gone through. My husband sings with the Ukrainian choir, and the Ukrainian people, I had an experience where I was invited along with my husband, because he's so involved with them, to go down to a particular event. And I remember the oppressiveness that I felt in this particular environment I was in, because on the walls, on the walls, were these photos of people that died because the Russians were starving the Ukrainians to keep dominion over them. It's a horrible story. It's like the stories about Auschwitz and things like this. It shows you a part of the human character and personality that often we want to hide. We want to gloss it over. We want to paint it. So you see, these are things that you have to deal with. But I remember coming out of there. I said, I have to leave this room. Because not only did the room have all of this material, that was demonstrated. But these people, this was in their spirit. This is in their soul. This is their history. They carry a burden that is so dark and so deep, and it's reiterated over and over and over again. And now look at what's happening. We've got all the stuff in the news. If you don't know the history, how can you tell the story? If you don't know you may just have something very superficial. So, there's a time and place for superficial writing. There's a time and place for being flippant. There's a need for all of that. But remember, when you're doing fiction, it is, it's, it's a marvelous experience. Brainstorming. This is something that's very good. If you, and in this classroom, you have the opportunity to do that. You have the opportunity to brainstorm. And this you should do. You should not feel inhibited, and I know Scott wouldn't make you feel this way, but if you tell the story that maybe you're writing, don't be afraid of being criticized. Welcome the criticism. Don't be afraid of that. Because what you're going to find is that someone may make a point and you'll go, son of a gun. I never thought of that. I can add that to the story. You add maybe a new color of description or testimonial. You do something different. Also, you want to allow your imagination, and I've mentioned that to a degree. But your imagination is very important. And when it comes to fiction, remember, there are no rules. A lot of people that you wouldn't think could even make a buck on a book. For some reason, it takes off. Years ago, and those of you sitting here may or may not know this, you probably don't, but there was a series on television called The Love Boat. And it was this really cheesy series, but everybody loved it because you never knew, one, who was sleeping with who, who was wearing what that day, and what adventures were going on. Well, I met the woman that wrote the book. I actually read the book. It was the worst piece of crap I've ever read. I mean, there was nothing to it. And they were in little paper bags. Nothing. But someone caught on to the idea, and she became very wealthy because they decided they were going to take it and make it into a series because they saw the bigger picture. She was a lousy writer. She was terrible. But she had a good idea first. That's Why right. A good idea. So you never know what's going to grab. It's a fascinating thing. 
So when you write, you need to make it okay that you may not become rich and famous. But if you have integrity with yourself and you do a good job and you think of Tom Clancy and some other people, now they've become very popular. But he became a, such a popular writer because he had so much truth in the material. Scott did with his. Chris Adam did with his. Fadi did with hers. You write. And when I interviewed Scott, I asked him, I said, Scott, is there something relating to your material that affected you personally? That wasn't my exact statement, but he said, yeah. And he went into detail on that. And you see, for my listening audience, if I'm listening to an interview, and you tell me how you feel about this, if you're listening to an interview, don't you want to know a little bit about that person? Don't you want to know what it was that made them write the material? Now, when you have nonfiction material, that's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? You pretty well know when it's nonfiction what the subject matter is. But when you have as much diversity in the material in the books that I've given abroad this evening, it grabs you. You want to know more. Now when it comes to children's stories, you have another level of complexity. Children grab a lot more. I've had very intelligent conversations with three-year-olds. That was a big eye-opener. Don't ever think the kids don't pay attention to what's being said. They do. And of course, with an illustrated book, you have to balance things out. You need to make sure your art goes along with the script so that there's an identification. There's a whole near genre, a whole, a whole different genre when it comes to doing the children's books. It's a whole different world in publishing. So writing is a, is a great adventure. And one of the things that I wanted to say, too, here, words are like good choreography. When you watch a group of dancers, and you're in awe, music is playing, you watch these dancers move and do things, and you just, you just are mesmerized by them. There is a flow. They're telling a story. There's a choreography, and that is what it is in the art of storytelling. You need to remember you want that kind of fluidity. You want to have this ease, sometimes of moving between different time zones, parallel words, worlds of different expressions. Words are magical, they're wonderful. But one of the things that really grabs people is when you talk to them, and Scott said this earlier, in your own language in their language. You have to know the language. I wouldn't know the language of the street person. That's not part of my world on a regular basis. I don't necessarily know the language of a medical field. But if someone writes well enough, anyone can pick up that book and they will understand the language. And that's part of what your challenge is as a writer. Who do you want to reach? How do you want to reach them? Do you want to touch their hearts, their minds? Do you want to create mystery? Do you want to create fantasy? Do you want to make up a world that nobody's ever seen before? Do you want to talk about your headache? I mean, I don't care what it is you've got in there, but there has to be that flavor. There has to be that flavor. And I'll guarantee you, you do have a muse. And sometimes the muse is going to meet you at the most unusual time, and you need to have a notebook with you at all times. You need to have something. The smartphone is great, but if you have a notebook. When 